you can't figure out where you're going if you don't know where you've come from. And I think that um, the challenges around understanding the history, the true history of British Columbia as it relates to the First Nations people of this land is really a complex one. And it's actually different than the rest of the country. So the, the sort of the notion of a pan-Canadian understanding is really, really challenging. And, and I mentioned to you I grew up in Tlaman, at that time known as Slyaman, uh, the white version of the name, if you will. And I, I was fortunate enough not to go to residential school, but I went to the, uh, the local public school, the elementary school, and, uh, which was a couple of miles away, and we'd get bused there every day. And um, my parents were residential school survivors and had gone through such an experience that um, although I was growing up on reserve, it was really apparent to me that, um, well, their, their approach was that uh, because of their experience at residential school, learning my language, my culture, my identity wasn't important. Going to school was going to be, and I needed to learn to be like that. Um, what was interesting for me at school was that uh, part of the, the school system was around uh, creating a, uh, you know, a, a grouping of students. And, and the groupings they used, it was interesting enough, were, were um, uh, at that time Indian names, if you will. So I learned about um, uh, Iroquois, Cree, and Mohawk, and I was part of the Iroquois house at the James, at the James Thompson Elementary School. So uh, it was funny because um, in the community I, I um, was, was playing soccer as a kid, and I started when I was 10, and the first team that we put together in the um, community, uh, the coach, who was a community leader, just called it Coast Salish. And I was lost. I couldn't figure that out. I was kind of going, what? I thought I was Iroquois. You know, so I was looking at things from a perspective where all I knew and all I was being taught as a young child was this pan-Canadian kind of history. And it was starting with Iroquois, Mohawk, and Cree, which obviously are back east. And the whole idea of uh, Tlaam and identity and history never came forward the whole time I was in the public school system. After I left the public school system, there was, um, because of the work being done in the community, the beginning of, of uh, teaching language in the schools and things like that. And so we had some good work being done in our community to do that. But that's a generation behind me. And so it's an interesting journey as I'm on and uh, the work that I've done over my career to reconnect with my community, to really understand the importance of our rights and title, and to really reflect on what has happened and how we got to where we are today. So the... Um, the idea of transforming relationships is fundamental, and it's something that we talk about at all levels of, of society. And, and in, in the health system, I think that, um, and those of you trained as physicians, understand the hierarchical approaches that are taking within this health system. And I think you need to understand how it emphasizes more exponentially the concerns we have as a, as a population that, from our experience with decolonization, was disempowerment. And so we'll talk a bit about that, but we'll also talk about some of the, um, the situation as we see it and how we see about moving forward in the work that we've been doing. So we always say we've got to know where we've come from, and to build a new relationship, you need to know who we are. And each of you from all parts of the province, um, I really appreciate, uh, you know, Galt, Dr. Wilson, provided that traditional welcome. And I know that um, part of that's been as a result of our partnership, and I appreciated the way that you've done that, and it was an excellent job. Um, I, I wonder if each of you understand whose territory you work in, whose territory you live in, and how they think about their unceded territory. Uh, that's an important fundamental piece because when you look at First Nations from a health and wellness point of view, our health and wellness is, is connected to our lands and resources. And our experience with colonization is about trauma. And in today's environment, there are still traumas that we're experiencing uh, for example, those of you that are around the areas of wildfires in the last couple of years can imagine the, the, the ways that communities are trying to rebound and, and the impact of that. Um, our First Nations communities in those situations in terms of emergency response last year was practically invisible. Our people were showing up being evacuated from homes to evacuation centers and being denied because their community name wasn't on a list that included all the mainstream white name towns, Prince George, whatever. And it was just amazing to think that those communities have been there a lot longer than these other settlements, and yet they're still invisible. And then it goes on and on and on, and there was even a, um, a situation last year and this year that we heard where communities often don't want to be evacuated for lots of reasons. They want to protect what little they have left. 
because the fe feeling was that the emergency response was really covering all the other, the assets of the province, which isn't our assets. Um, so that was very concerning to, to community members. And there were times when the RCMP was threatening to go in, and if you weren't going to leave, they're going to take your children. And you can imagine how well that went over considering our history. So those things are happening today. And the reason I wanted to show the videos was that mainstream media um, is capturing these things. And there is opportunity to learn and understand them. There is a um, current series on APTN um, around first contact. I think it's going last two or three nights or something like that. And, and they've taken some, some people that, have, that are non-Indigenous and placed them in First Nations communities for some experiential learning and understanding. And I haven't seen it myself, but I get the gist of it. And the outcome of it is a, a revelation of all the things that they thought that weren't true. Um, and really a better appreciation for what the communities are dealing with. And so we'll, we'll kind of cover some of that a little bit. But um, in British Columbia, just the reflection of who we are in, as BC First Nations. You see here we have a map of the province. It's based on cultural groups and languages. So you see 26 cultural groups, 34 languages. The history of colonization in this province created over 200 Indian bands. We were separated. It's also under, important to understand that in British Columbia, the historic treaty making really ended for the most part in Alberta, what's now Alberta. And um, British Columbia, we have very little of that in the Treaty 8 area. We have some of our communities are part of Treaty 8, which also goes into Alberta. And then on southern Vancouver Island, we have the Douglas Treaties. British Columbia, uh, because whatever the reason was, and there's lots of speculation about why didn't Canada finish that work, um, most of our First Nations then are left without formal agreement with the federal and provincial governments, particularly the federal government at the time with the fiduciary responsibilities that they, they have. And I think what uh, is fundamentally important to that, though, is that our people had never stopped fighting to, to set that relationship right. And one of those indicators for me um, is, is around Aboriginal case law in this country. And to, to go back and understand at what point could First Nations actually hire a lawyer that was legal for us, we, for a long time that was not legal for us to hire legal representation to represent ourselves in the courts of this land. Uh, but when we were able to back, you know, mid-19, whatever, um, what happened was that you will see that pretty much every 10 years there's a major Aboriginal court case that comes out of British Columbia from different parts of our province that do different things. To, the, to one of the latest court cases uh, just a, a couple of years ago now in the Chakotan area, in the Williams Lake area, uh, where the Chakotan were able to establish Aboriginal title for the first time ever, where the courts previously acknowledged it, but they wouldn't really say where, where it was and what it all meant. So that's starting to happen now, and it's changing the way that the relationships are now moving forward. And you, a lot of, a lot of British Columbians saw recently the Kinder Morgan case that came out in the local nations here and their role in that, and that a very major part of that decision was around the in, inappropriate consultation and accommodation of government working with those nations and other nations that are impacted by that, that development. And so the consultation accommodation court case also comes out of British Columbia a number of years ago out of the, out of the Haida Taku area. So it's really fundamental to think about uh, the population of First Nations people that are trying to find their space and place based on who they are and where they're from and what this place means to them. I think it's uh, also fundamental to recognize, you know, uh, based on colonization, um, We've organized ourselves to try and address these issues. We have politi large political groups, um, the First Nations uh, Summit, the Union BC Indian Chiefs, and the BC Assembly of First Nations to represent ourselves. And uh, one of the challenges that we have as First Nations people is, is uniting under a common approach in how these issues work because of the diversity of uh, what is now divided into 200 legal entities under the Indian Act. Uh, but with that, we've been able to make some extreme, extremely successful progress in, in the area of health, and we'll talk a bit more about it. So I think it's, you know, again, um, in terms of understanding our history and, and where we come from and understanding how things were in those early days. And um, I think one of the, as I sort of talk about this, and I was thinking about some of the work I'll talk about a little bit later from uh, what's been uncovered in the Sanyas training, and I'll talk about that, is that there's a lack of denial for our colonial history. So. Obviously, I'm starting with it because that's what I'm taught, is that we have to understand where we came from and how we got here today. So this, this concept of terra nullius was what the colonial uh, 
um, powers to be brought to this country. And they really described it, although there were First Nations people all over the place, that it was uninhabited. Because the way that they saw us using the land and how we thought about things was so different from them. The label of savage and, and you know, those kinds of things were, were put, put forward and, and made, um, from their point of view, valid that uh, the people that were here before them, that they discovered, um, although we were here first, um, really was uh, an opportunity for them to carry out the colonial agenda around, you know, expanding across the world and, and for, the, for the access of resources and other things that, that moved, that, that really drove their agendas. So policy and legislation was, was put in place to really remove the, the indigenous population from their land and their relationship to the, um, to the territories that they're on. And, and I think that, you know, what's really fundamental to this, and you, we'll talk about it as we go through a little bit, is that um, I, was, I was in, in 2008 uh, at, a, at a First Nation Summit leadership meeting, and we were all watching, you know, Stephen Harper's apology for residential schools at the time. And that very clear statement around the intentions of the government to kill the Indian and the child. I think it's... Um, you know, something that really stuck with me, um, that one, it took so long to get to the apology, but two, now that it was actually said, what would we do about it? And I think that's been always the case as we sort of go through all the issues that are there today. And it's not easy. It's not an easy situation. But when you reflect on what we have here on the screen, that um, our people have been here since time immemorial, and the way that we understand, you know, our societies and our families and our laws and our connection to our lands and resources ha has, has done well for us um, for, for a long, long time. And we look at this history of colonization as, as a really a, you know, a, a pothole in the road in our journey, and we're coming out of it now. Uh, but to do that, and you hear the discussion on reconciliation, you know, we need to do that together with everyone around us. So we talk about the Indian Act, um, some of the legislation that was put in place because the land was uninhabited. There needs to be legislation put in place to control the indigenous population. And it's interesting to think about a, a piece of legislation like this that first came into you know, being in 1876, and it's still alive today. I, I stand before you as a ward of the state, and as a status Indian, that's how I'm recognized. Um, and it creates things. Um, it, and my family, for example, again, uh, when my, my dad passed away in 2005, uh, we couldn't do anything with his estate until the Department of Indian Affairs at the time said it was okay to do that. Uh, the land, the reserve land at the time, was held for us by the state. We weren't allowed to own it. Um, a lot of things around that. There was really a, a sense of, you know, the, the notion of what they're trying to do there. So you think about the segregation that it created, you know, further to that, the Indian hospitals and residential schools we'll touch on, um, and a lot of other things that go with it. You know, the, I already talked about the um, denied access to justice and really the approach of cultural genocide. Uh, you can think about, um, as we move on towards residential schools, the impact that that had and um, the idea of forcing children out of community into residential schools. And you can think about not only did our people get alienated from their territory and put on a reserve as a very small piece of their territory, we're told then that they needed to stay there and that then they would be provided everything that they needed. But then it was deemed that their kids should leave and leave sometimes for the entire year, many of which never went home again, ever. And we know the story of the residential schools around the sexual abuse and the violence. Um, and, and again, that was the policy to kill the Indian and the child. And, and I think fundamentally to that is think about communities. Think about your families with no children and the impact what that does to a society that's based on family values. And you start taking out a key component of that, and, and, and that in itself is a major, major trauma that we talk about intergenerational trauma. And trying to understand how um, um, people, parents, and, grand, and grandparents, and others, great-great-grandparents in communities that had roles and responsibilities to pass on things through our oral traditions and culture, the teachings and values of our people, that, that chain was broken through the time that people went away. The numbers that went away were 150 Aboriginal children taken. 
uh, you know, when you think about that, you, you think about that number, you think about what that looks like in British Columbia and our communities, and you also, before that, understand the history. If we talked about our health journey since contact, you know there were times of disease and we lost a lot of people. So the rebounding of that and then trying to kill our society and taking children out is a fundamental harm. Um, the residential schools themselves for our survivors represent an institution of education and, and spirituality, if you will, thinking about the role of the churches that our people learn not to trust. And, the, and the, the authorities that came to take our kids from the federal government or the RCMP are people are not to trust. So it's really interesting when we think about how long does it take to get past that. Uh, that, that in itself, when you think about the generations of it. And so, as I mentioned, my, my uh, parents were both residential school survivors. And I have lots of, um, well... Sometimes I say I have lots of understanding of what that's like, and a lot of times what I have is a lot of blank because I've, I've tuned it out because of the things that happened for me as a child. But then I think about it when I'm raising my own son, and my perspective I took was more about not knowing what he needed but knowing what I didn't want him to experience. So it's an interesting way of looking at raising a child. Um, and as I'm hoping for him and my work here, is to make his future and his, his life better than what I experienced as a child. And that's kind of how we're all pushed in this world anyway. But it, it's understanding that my son and his generation from my mom and dad and then their, their generation and all their parents' generation and so on, and all those impacts, we're still living with them. And we're still here talking about resetting relationships with society around us. And people, as you see them in the media all the time, still fighting for their rights and who they are and where they want their place to be. So I think that, um, you know, talking just a little bit about the Indian hospitals, an opportunity to reflect on, as we're talking today with, with here sharing with the physicians that are in this room, a recognition that this was put in place purposely too uh, by, by government. And again, uh, not only a way of segregation, but a lot of things that happened in those hospitals, like experimentation and other things, were not very positive experiences, as you can imagine. And again, a lot of people that go there and don't go home. Stories of, you know, if our people go there, they're going to go there to die. They won't come back. Became a norm. So that across, you know, the, the province, of, across the country, um, again, aligned with residential schools. And you can understand our challenges around what will that look like in today's world. And I think it's really, you know, trying to think about from our point of view, then the other side for me is to think about you know, the people that were working there, uh, representatives of whoever, the residential schools, like I said, you had the churches, in the hospitals, you had medical professionals and others. And, and so their intentions, what they thought they were doing from that point of view, what they thought was right based on their perspective and their worldview, is a lot different than what was happening to us in that reality. And today we know that, everybody is aware of that. But it's not something that we can just say, well, it happened a long time ago. Because there are people here today that families are still experiencing both residential school trauma and Indian hospital trauma in our communities today. And, and as I say, the, Le the Indian Act legislation still lives on. So I think it's been really important in this province to see the evolution of our relationships both federally and provincially now, um, governments uh, recently, these, these last iterations of government, federal and provincial, have both acknowledged and finally made commitment to the implementation of the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report and its recommendations. So I think it's, um, it's, a, it's a great opportunity in terms of having that kind of recognition. Um, it is fairly recent. In British Columbia, we're fortunate, as I say, our leadership has been pushing for this all along. And the work that we're doing in health has actually started before governments formally committed to these, these, um, these important documents. So we, we talk about this, and here you see um, uh, Chief Ian Campbell from the Squamish Nation talking at one of our events uh, about, uh, and I really truly believe that if anyone on Squamish land should look to receive culturally safe services, it's the Squamish people. We're on their unceded territory. And so that acknowledgement of we're in a place, time and place where um, we're no longer invisible, I think is fundamentally important. And 
obviously uh, Dr. Az and myself being here today and being on your agenda, being part of the discussions leading up to this in terms of the work we're doing with um, the College on Cultural Safety and Humility demonstrates that that time has come. Um, just a little bit about our work and the reconciliation among ourselves. As I mentioned, the divisiveness of the, the uh, Indian Act and the creating of the 200 some odd Indian bands in this province and the way that we're supported and funded by government creates competition among ourselves to try and get access to scarce resources. And, and a lot of, um, with the breaking down of our traditional governance structures, other kinds of challenges that come forward as a result of um, trying to implement a... Uh, uh, a governance system of chief and council that's really imposed on us as Indigenous people that really doesn't look to the traditional laws that we have and our connection to our lands and resources, but is more about, um, uh, you know, just program and services and the money in front of us. Um, so it's a, a bit of a challenge for us, but we've done some important work that first and foremost in this work, British Columbia First Nations agreed to partner among themselves. And so in, in May 2011, and so I started this work around 20, 2006, in 2011, uh, we as First Nations came together and our leadership made what I call the largest self-determination decision in this country to agree to work together on a, under one umbrella of health. And that was really stemmed from uh, a resetting of a relationship between the provincial government at the time, which was the liberal government, um, the previous liberal government early on in its in its um, initial terms that was really uh, fighting with First Nations people on what they thought was the ability to move ahead with the economic agenda in British Columbia. So again, it was based on the unresolved land question and the, the need to consult and accommodate that uh, it wasn't working for at that time, Premier Gordon Campbell. Uh, his commitment to work with First Nations was about a new relationship and understanding that we had processes in place that weren't working and if we effectively changed that relationship, maybe we could make progress together. So he did some work with our First Nations leadership from those three political organizations and were able to really capture the essence of, of a new relationship that would look at it, addressing the social and economic gaps that existed between First Nations people in British Columbia and the rest of, our, rest of British Columbia. And um, fundamentally, health was one of the priorities, so away we went. And we're able to lead up to this work to launch the um, both what was in 2006 the, a bilateral First Nations Transform and Change Accord First Nations Health Plan, and then a tripartite plan a, a little bit later with the federal government that really pushed this work to to really a governance level. I think what was important to reflect on in the in the premier's commitment was the acknowledgement of First Nations people as British Columbians and especially from a health perspective, and that the provincial government acknowledging its role as the major service provider of health services under the Constitution of Canada, that although the federal government through its fiduciary has some responsibility for First Nations health, that BC First Nations people were at that time welcomed into the provincial health system by the Premier as British Columbians and were, were, had the right to access services regardless of where they lived in a culturally safe way. And so it was really interesting to see that come forward and what that resulted in, some of the cultural competency training that was called at the time, that is now the Sanyas Cultural Safety and Humility Training, as we refer to it, um, that I think a lot of you may, may or may not be aware of, and other things that have come from that, um, and a lot of relationships that are now moving because we have this governance structure where we sit, you know, with through, through this, this set of arrangements that have been um, endorsed by the highest level of government, both federally and provincially. Uh, through a health um, agenda, through this new health governance partnership uh, with the, the ministry, through the deputy minister, all the health authorities and their CEOs, and now through the work we're doing in cultural safety and humility, all the regulatory bodies through the registrars and, and, and that infrastructure to, to get here today for this kind of a conversation. And, and it's an amazing undertaking, and you know better than I how big and complex your system is and how siloed it can be in, in many, many discussions that you have and how you look to move this health system forward to meet the needs of the population today. What we describe we've been able to create here is a space of innovation that really belongs, you know, in a, in a space between the federal, provincial, and First Nations working together that allows for innovation that isn't really always available through the regular system as it tries to move itself for, forward in a very um, cumbersome way. Um, we, we take our concepts and we develop them into our, our philosophies, our Indigenous perspectives, 
Here you have what we call our ecosystem health and wellness, and we could spend a whole day on this um, around describing the different elements of it. Fundamentally, what you see here is in the center our perspective, BC First Nations perspective of health and wellness that represents a holistic view of who we are. You see the human being in the center and how we see ourselves in our health and wellness journey and our connection to all those things around us. At the left side, you see this notion of it starts with me. So the impact of colonization has disempowered our people. And our teachings and traditions talk to us about how we own what we own. And our health and wellness journey is one of those things that we own and the responsibilities that go with that. So you see across the top a reflection of a decision-making framework that is what we've created for ourselves to be able to do this work effectively. And not only the fact that we own our health and wellness journey, but we have the right to make decisions about what that looks like. And it was interesting in the opening about talking about how health services need to help people and, and provide for them what they need. And it is fundamental for us to understand that until there's a really, really high level of acuity, the health system should be able to meet us where we're at on our health and wellness journey, but needs to understand where it is we're trying to go. So if you don't understand the people, how do you help them when you don't really have a reflection or an understanding of their journey? And ultimately, we talk a bit about the, on the bottom end, you see a couple of things just reference quickly is about the partnership. So the partnership through this health governance partner partnership is really around these relationships that I talk about and how we work as partners to move this work forward and how we enable and support and build strength among our partnerships uh, to be able to do the work that we need to do. And I find that a lot of the work that we're doing is actually helping not only our Indigenous population, but other British Columbians because of the way that First Nations look at health and wellness. A lot of British Columbians kind of go, yeah, that looks good for me too. I kind of like it that way as well. And the other part, you know, in terms of talking about health and wellness services, it's really the idea of bringing together the best of both worlds, that we recognize the value of Western medicine, but we also want to recognize the value of our traditional knowledge, and our traditional medicines and ways of being as it relates to our health and wellness journey. And that whenever there is something happening with an individual on their health and wellness journey, it's not always a medical fix to that situation. A lot of times it's a disconnection from their spirit, from their culture, from their traditions, and a different way of thinking about it. And we all consider that mental health and wellness um, is one of our biggest issues in this province that's really driving everybody. Um, it's really fundamental to understand things differently. So I think it's, you know, I, I need to move quickly to make sure I don't take all Dr. Adams' time. Um, so I will look to do that. And um, thinking about some of the harmful encounters, again, the three perspectives here, we remember, so we know where we've come from. We need to understand that from a place of intergenerational trauma. We witness some of the things that we see here um, with uh, Michelle up top and that, that prescription she received from Victoria. She lives in Victoria. And, you know, so again, it's not that far away from here. And these are the things that are happening. And you see um, another individual on the, on the bottom uh, from up north, um, Chuck, who was uh, not diagnosed, you know, four, four visits until they diagnosed he actually had a stroke. Uh, so these things are happening uh, all the time. Um, the experience, so we talk a bit about that in terms of what we experience so that informs us in terms of how we think we want to move forward and what we learn from this in terms of talking with our partners. So a lot of very important pieces here. And I find that it's, you know, it's really interesting that um, I talk about the, and want to give acknowledgement to the um, work at PHSA for the cultural safety training, which since 2010, this was a commitment in the bilateral plan I talked about in November 2006. And some work was done with folks at PHSA connected in with some of our team at the time. And it's since continued to evolve this training that we really think about the fact that, you know, in British Columbia, the training has mentioned that 31,000 people in BC have been trained, taken this training, this online training. Of that, you know, we recognize that it's about 25, when we look at the numbers from the health authorities who have commitments to this, that is 25% of the population. So of their, pop, their workforce, which is still small, and are they the right ones? Not sure, but that's where we're at. For the FNHA, for us being part of this, and, and for us to lead by example, we have over 90% plus of our staff have taken this training. And we recognize too that this training isn't the be all end all, it's the beginning of the journey. So it's so much more than that. And, and um, I think it's important that recognizing that from this training, they're capturing really rich information. They're identifying the top stereotypes that are coming across as health providers that are taking the training are sharing, having dialogue. 
and you see the list of them here. You see some of the behaviors that they're identifying that are happening among, among physicians and other care providers as they're providing services to the indigenous population. And they have many stories that they gap, capture in their, from their data. And here, here's a, just a little example, example that looks at how um, you know, our people are not fully human and they're dehumanized, in fact, and the stories are here that are up on the screen. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of that that comes out of that. And this is real time today. And the value of, of just pulling that out and understanding that these issues are real and, there, and there's a lot of them just tells us that this isn't as, you know, it's, it's, it's not invisible. But I think what was really fundamental to that for me was, was understanding that um, people in the health system felt unsafe and that it's such a hierarchical system that there are a lot of great people in the system but don't know how to address issues when they see someone who may be more senior than them exercising some kind of behavior that they feel is not right for the individual they're providing care to, whether it's an Indigenous person or not. But the Indigenous person and, and the plan that we have give us a focal point to start a lot of very difficult conversations in a system that's not really receptive to that. And in our view, from a First Nations point of view, we see the system set up in a way to protect itself. And I understand why at times it needs to do that. For other things, though, it's not right because it's not advancing the issues that we have. So we've developed the First Nations Health Authority, our vision for cultural safety and humility, and it's here. There is work that Dr. Adams will talk about in terms of the work that we're doing and what we'll ask of you as individuals because we feel that we have to make systemic changes, but it also starts with each and every one of you. And our campaign to you know, create change it really is around everyone making their own commitments and the things that you can do. And so you, each of you coming here today is the beginning of your journey if you haven't already started it. And I think that's really awesome. Um, just, you know, in terms of there's a whole storyline with the Williams Lake situation that really has um, shows how our, our work from a system level with a commitment of Interior Health CEO, once the issue was identified, the story from the, the, the elder from the community of... of, of um, Huxall on, on um, in, in around the Williams Lake area and the experiences that that individual had who had to be sent all the way down to Vancouver eventually um, from Kamloops and wasn't getting the right care in Williams Lake, um, finally getting diagnosed with a brain tumor down in Vancouver and now providing care back at home. But um, the the whole sort of storyline around uh, you know the the focusing on on addiction issues as opposed to on the health issues which he was presenting. And again, you've seen stories where people um, end up um, uh, not, not surviving because of that. And so it's, it's about understanding where does stereotyping and racism fit into that. And so we're having great discussion with not only the work that's come out of that with the nations and what you see down there is a declaration on the bottom that was signed with the workers and the local leadership in that area and they're resetting relationships um, to the point of now we're talking with Interior Health about uh, the rebuild of the hospital and how to make improvements there, but also potential new primary care opportunities and really, you know, dealing with some of those issues around having our um, First Nations and Indigenous population connected into the health system a little bit more upstream and in a culturally safe way. So the work we do has resulted in declarations. This has been our system-wide approach. I think fundamentally here what I would say is that we talk about cultural safety, but it really is the 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 element of cultural humility that's important, that as, as people that are highly trained, consider that you want to be open to learning about people and who they are and where they're from, especially indigenous population where that complexity can be a little bit different, but it's very much specific to what's happening with that indigenous population in this country and specifically in this province. So there's a lot of great opportunity for that that we'll talk about. Uh, the declaration here signed by the Deputy Minister and the CEOs of the Health Authorities with myself in 2015 really was a big push forward in this work and that acknowledgement as we create um, avenues of reciprocal accountability about how we want to move that through the health system. Obviously, it was important then to connect in with the regulatory bodies as another major component of this system. And here you see some of the blanketing that went on uh, with the regulatory group um, after the signing in, in March of that year to really close it with ceremony and do it right. And um, that we've since participated at, at that training symposium in the fall 2017, and, and now we're here today specifically to support this conversation. Um, at, what I really appreciated in October there is that the health regulators um, committed a whole day to this discussion. 
and, and it was a full day and some really interesting pieces that we were trying to launch the work with all the regulatory bodies across the province, recognizing that it needs to translate into more specific discussions with the various health providers based on where you sit, where you come from, and how it works for you. Um, I think that, um, you know, as we're, head, as we're looking at this work, it really is about hardwiring uh, cultural safety humility into the health system. So we talk about all the groups. You see the list there on the bottom of, of who we have declarations with. We're starting to talk to the professional associations as well. Um, I think it's a race between maybe the docs and the nurses to see which association might be willing and brave enough to sign the first declaration. I think that's quite exciting because then I would have an opportunity to bring together the regulatory body, the association, the ministry, and the health authority to talk about it from the perspective of one group, whether it's the docs or the nurses. And it's interesting to see, like, why, why is it still delaying? And the, the nervousness around what it means, and are they willing to really take that on and embrace the challenge that it represents? To me, it's a lot better to incorporate a discussion around cultural safety and humility and recognize that at some point in time, it's about dealing with some of those areas of racism. But if we do it this way, we can build a positive relationship first before we get into the hard issues. I think that's really fundamental, that if we don't get to know one another, we may not come at the hard issues in the right way to actually make progress.